Hi, I'm uh, Paul Beckwith. I'm with the Laboratory for Paleoclimatology at the University of Ottawa. And I want to talk a little bit about the uh, present state of the climate. Uh, I've got some company here uh, so that this video uh, hopefully can go viral. So what's going on with the uh, climate system? Basically, hey, hey, hey. Okay, he's gone. Okay, no cats were harmed in the uh, filming of this video. Okay, so let's see what's going on with the Arctic. The, we're, we're in a, a, a new state here. Um, the planet is behaving like it's never behaved before, as long as humans have been on it. Um, the Arctic is tremendously warm right now. In fact, if you go north of about 70 degrees or so, the, uh, we're having days right now where the, the average temperature over the entire region uh, for a particular time, particular day, is over 8 degrees Celsius warmer than normal. That's over the entire region. It's fluctuating um, over time from about being plus 6 degrees to plus uh, 8 degrees, like I say. Uh, there's tremendous pools of warm air over Greenland. We have open sea ice in these particular regions. We have, uh, and we have methane emissions coming up from the seafloor in the Kara Sea and in the East Siberian uh, continental shelf. Uh, there's also tremendous pools of warm air, you know, over the entire, over the North Pole over the the entire region. So what is this doing? Well, first of all, the sea ice is supposed to still be forming. It's winter. It's supposed to still be forming up until about the first or second week of March. But what happened was it seemed to peak February 9th and then dip down a little bit and then, you know, have another sub peak February 16th. And since then it's been heading down. We don't know for sure if those are the, the, the maxima. You know, it may turn upwards, but right now it's heading downwards. It's likely that February 9th was the maxima for sea ice extent and February 16th for the sea ice area. Um, anyway, the curve is way below the, all the, the curves of all the other years. So the sea ice is just, it's sea slush, it's crap, it's ridiculously low. And we're clearly heading to a state of no ice in the Arctic by the end of the melt season. Whether it happens this summer or next year, or, you know, it certainly is heading, tre trending downwards. Um, it's certainly probably, it, it will, you know, my, in my view, it's going to happen before 2020. You know, it could be, it could be uh, next summer. Uh, what's it gone for uh, a week or two or up to a month in the first year when we have this blue ocean event, it will then, the feedbacks will kick in because the Arctic is much darker. So then we'll be looking at extended durations of complete loss of sea ice. So it'll go from being gone in September to being gone in August, September on October. And then it will go July, August, September, October, November, and probably within about a decade from the first blue ocean event, it'll be gone year round. And at that point, we'll be in a, a new climate state, a climate state in which there is basically an equalization of temperature with latitude, um, much more so than now. now the cold Arctic and the warm equator creates a, that temperature gradient creates the movement of air and the movement of oceans from carrying heat from the equator to the pole. And the, because of the rotation of the earth, that air is deflected to the right, forming the jet streams. And the jet streams act as a wall between the cold, dry Arctic air and the warm, moist equatorial air. So with those jet streams slowing down because of the loss of the temperature gradient from the equator to the pole, we get 
a the jet streams uh, follow a path that is more dependent on the ocean uh, air, the ocean land contrast. So we get big troughs in the jet stream and big ridges, and it's very warm up in the ridges, and it's very cold in the in the troughs. So this is the sort of thing that we're seeing, and we're seeing this pattern um, frequently occurring now. So I've talked about this in, in many previous videos. In fact, I've been talking about this for about the last four or five years. Um, I've done over a hundred videos trying to explain how severe climate change is to try to explain how quickly it is occurring. And it continues to surprise me how, you know, press articles and, and how scientists and how general media, whether it be print or videos or news reports, are always saying, hey, Antarctica's losing ice much faster than scientists have expected. The methane is coming up from the permafrost much faster than expected. Look, we're in an exponential world here. We're not seeing linear changes happening in the climate system, which we're familiar with. We're seeing nonlinear changes. We're seeing abrupt changes. We seem to have passed a tipping point in the behavior of the climate system, and we've gone to an unstable system. And it's like, how, how can this, how can these changes still be surprising to people? You know, they just need to, like we need scientists around the world to just have a look at this from new eyes, you know, take those blinders off, get rid of those silos, you know, look at the big system picture and look at how things are changing and come and say exactly what is happening. Use the language to describe to the public what is happening. You know, no sugar coating, no, there's, there, I mean, how can we always have 10 years left to address the problem? We've run out of time, we have no time. We have to look at very, very, we have to treat climate change extremely seriously. It's a threat to human existence on this planet. So what we need to do is we need to zero fossil fuel emissions as quickly as possible. Studies show that we could probably do it by 2030. You know, if we put our minds to it, if we treated this problem with the merits that it deserves, we could uh, completely retool society extremely quickly. And we need to do that. But like I've been telling people, this is only one, uh, this is only one leg of the, of the bar stool, okay? This is the fossil fuel leg. We have to zero emissions, okay? But there's two other legs, and if you remove any of those legs, then the stool, of course, is unstable, and it just tips over if it's on one leg or if it's on two legs. So what are the other legs? Well, this leg is of next importance, and... The Arctic warming is obviously going to cause huge methane releases from the, the uh, permafrost on the land and also from the permafrost and marine sediments underneath. And we're talking about or the incredible amounts of organic matter that is in the that is buried in the under on, both on the land and under the ocean when it's thawed, then that organic matter is broken down by bacteria, and in the presence of oxygen, it produces CO2, but in the absence of oxygen, it produces methane. And methane is an extremely potent gas. There's also methane tied up in methane clathrates, which is a latest of frozen water surrounding a methane molecule. And in Siberia, we've seen, especially on the Yamal Peninsula, we've seen lots of cases where the methane clathrates in, under the ground are thawing out. And when they thaw out, the latest goes away, the latest of water, the cage breaks down, the methane is released, and the volume expands 160 to 180 times, something like that. It builds up pressure under the ground, and then it blows a big hole in the ground. So this is already happening. It's also being seen on the seafloor. 
So we have to base, we have to cool the Arctic. Um, one of the most promising methods is marine cloud brightening. So low level marine clouds created to, so that as the sea ice is retreating, that white surface is being replaced by dark seawater. If we create low level clouds over that dark seawater, that will reflect sunlight in the summer and cause, cause cooling. So we need to deploy systems like that as soon as possible. That's the second leg. But then that's not sufficient because the, the uh, CO2 levels are so high in the atmosphere that uh, when, when, it's, it's, um, when it rains, it captures some of the CO2 and brings it down into the ocean. So the oceans are acidifying and this is threatening the whole food chain in the ocean because lots of the uh, phytoplankton that grows on the surface because it needs sunlight it needs CO2, which we're providing lots of. It also needs nutrients from below. And as the ocean's warming, it's becoming stratified and it's, there's less vertical mixing. So it's not getting those nutrients from below. So therefore there's a lot less phytoplankton and there's a lot less zooplankton, a lot less fish. The whole marine food chain is under threat. So as the ocean is acidifying, the phytoplankton that have calcium carbonate backbones cannot form their backbones. So Diatoms are okay, although diatom levels have been dropping. They're based on silicon dioxide backbone, but the coccolithophores and the foraminifers and the other types of phytoplankton that are based on, on calcium carbonate backbones uh, basically can't form and produce, and this ripples up the entire food chain. So we have to remove CO2 from the atmosphere ocean system. If we remove it from the atmosphere, then it, then more will come out of the oceans to replace what we remove in the atmosphere. So we have to remove a lot from the atmosphere and then it will come out of both the ocean and atmosphere system. There's also methods where we can tr remove it from the ocean um, and it might be easier to remove it from seawater. Um, so, you know, it, there we have, it's not a technological issue. It's an issue of human stupidity to, to not recognize how severe the problem is and to do something about it. I'm talking about human stu stupidity at all levels. I'm talking about a, a whole economic system, a capitalist system that doesn't treat CO2 as an externality. I'm talking about stupidity of climate change deniers who are very well funded by oil companies and companies that want to maintain the status quo. And those, the, 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 those are criminal activities. Those are fraudulent criminal activities that threaten the health of all of us. So this is really a, a political issue. Um, this is not a technological issue. This is not a scientific issue anymore. This is just an issue of like, what is wrong with the human brain? Is it not capable of recognizing the problem and solving the problem? You know, Stephen Hawkins is worried about, uh, about artificial intelligence, about, uh, you know, robots, cre you know, computers that, have artificial intelligence that are more intelligent than humanity. Perhaps that's, you know, the, that's our, the, the, the say, you know, perhaps that is required because, you know, if we had an AI machine, um, then it would tell us, okay, you know, you guys are absolutely crazy. You humans are, try are absolutely, you know, destroying your planet and you're shooting, you know, you're shooting yourselves in the foot. You're destroying your air, you're destroying your water. You're de destroying all of the life support systems on the planet. And it would immediately go to the solutions, such as what I've been talking about. And, uh, you know, maybe that sort of thing. Like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've been talking, you can watch videos I've, do I've done three years ago. And, you know, I had my cats in one and uh, I'm talking about very similar things. But... You know, as time goes on and we transition through abrupt climate change, things are getting more and more serious and we have a choice here. We, our backs are up against the wall. You know, imagine putting the uh, 700, uh, $800 billion U.S. military budget towards, you know, get all those engineers and scientists that are developing better, more efficient ways to kill people and to destroy the planet and, 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 to, and to completely massacre opposition in war, you know, get those people to address the issue that the U.S. military is saying one of the biggest, is, is now the biggest threat that, that we face.